I'm happy to welcome Frederick Fenter at the Falling Walls Breakthrough Conversations. Frederick is Chief Executive Editor at Frontiers and supervises the entire Frontiers Journal portfolio, as well as being directly involved in all the strategic projects. He moved into academic publishing in 1997, first overseeing a portfolio of journals, book series, and major reference works at Elsevier Science, and then founding Fontis Media, a publishing technology startup that developed the first multi-language content management platform for scientific journals. He was also a technology advisor for the launch of an institutional document repository, InfoScience, and consulted for the founding of the English language EPFL Press. Today, we will have a discussion about open science, a topic that uh, Frederick is an active advocate for. Welcome, Frederick. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, that's an impressive the background research that you've done. I don't even know where you pulled that, where you got that from. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, let us start with our first question. So, you earned your PhD in chemistry at Harvard, and you started your career by conducting research on atmospheric compounds at CNRS in France and EPFL in Switzerland for many years. How did it happen that you ended up in scientific publishing afterwards? Yeah, I think the, uh, the, the two word answer to that is just professional mobility. Um, after after I, I, I finished my degree in the States, uh, I, I moved to Bordeaux. We, I got married to my Swiss girlfriend. We had our first baby. We moved to Switzerland. Uh, I, we got settled in. By the time I was at the end of my contract at the APFL, we had, I think my wife was pregnant with our fourth kid by then. And, uh, and so, you know, like a lot of scientists, I was at that stage in my career where I was still a little bit of a nomad, and it was time for me to move on to the next opportunity. And so I had um, discussions going with uh, laboratories in, in the UK and in Germany, but my wife, who was Swiss, said, uh, well, you know, you can go wherever you want, but I'm staying here with the kids. And so it was sort of a, a, a challenge for me to find some other direction to take my pre professional career. So, um, and then one day, you know, I, I knew that this, that, that I would have to kind of um, pass by there. And uh, one day I saw in the newspaper an advertisement for a pub publishing role at, uh, at Elsevier. There used to be an office in, in, at Elsevier in, in Lausanne. And, um, and I knew right away somehow the, the, the vibe of the whole thing felt right to me. And so I went there and uh, I, started, I started by managing the, uh, the inorganic chemistry program at Elsevier. So it was actually quite an interesting start to, to, to publishing. Um, Elsevier closed the office in 2000, and then that's when I started, uh, you know, you know, I think I made a very big decision to change my career towards publishing at the age of about 35, but then after that I said, well, I'm going to stick to the publishing thing. Even though Elsevier is closed in, in Lausanne, um, I started with my own imprint, I started publishing books, and then I started working with the APFL, and I became sort of the local publishing guy in, mm -hmm. in, this, in the French-speaking part of Switzerland. And it was in that context that I met Henry and Camilla Markram, and uh, we, together we launched uh, Frontiers around 2007. Interesting. Yeah, so it sort of came by chance, and then you... Yeah, no, but it's a problem that a lot of scientists have, a lot of young scientists, it's, it's this mobility problem, you know, it's if you have... You have you're trying to build a family. It's the right time in your life to start building a family, but you, the the this this nomadic sort of element of maintaining a high level professional career is 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 sometimes uh, very very difficult for uh, for 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 couples for families to, uh, to to manage. And so yeah, I mean, I think to be perfectly fair, I think this is something that disproportionately affects um, uh, young young ladies in science, um, but um, but. Again, you know, uh, it, it was also for this this type of uh, priority to, to, to for the towards the family that also led me to look for um, other 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 paths to follow. Mm -hmm. And a question that often comes up when researchers leave the lab and move to publishing: when you took that step, were you thinking, "I'm going to miss the lab"? Well, yeah, yes and no. I, I think that what I look back now, now, so look, I'm in my early 60s and, uh, you know, I keep in touch with some of, some of the people I, I worked with when I was in graduate school. And I, have, I feel like the, these, these last 35 years or so have gone, gone by in a snap. Um, what I see is that a lot of the friends that I have that are working in academia, they never really drifted very far from the core questions that they were attacking when they were in graduate school or when they were postdocs. I feel like I've had a, an entirely second 
life experience moving into business and learning about uh, you know, seeing society and making a different type of contribution. So I have absolutely no regrets at all. And actually, a lot of what what's interesting, what's new, and that, that, that's really the, the the pleasure of working in in scientific publishing in the last uh, the last thirty years or so is there's been this huge transition. I started; it was an entirely paper. It was a paper context. <laughs> there was no science direct. I think was launched in ninety seven or ninety eight. But before that, it was all just delivery of paper. And that's and. To, to have, uh, you know, when the internet came along, everybody knew that something was going to happen. And and to have been part of that re- evolution uh, o- o- over the last generation, uh, I, it's been extremely, it's been extremely enriching. And, and it is in itself a research project. You have to go about it sometimes with that spirit of trying to, 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 to look for the innov- innov- innovative way through and trying to find good solutions for, for problems. So you can almost frame a lot of what happens as a, as, as a research mm-hmm. problem. And speaking of evolution in publishing, one of the trends that we've seen is uh, the shift towards open access, right? Um, and uh, what impact do you think open access and the mandate to publish in open access uh, has had on COVID-19. Mm-hmm. And um, how? what was the impact also on uh, finding vaccines and treatments? Yeah, yeah, no, I, mean, I think that that's a very, very important issue. I think in five years from now, maybe even less, we'll look back and we'll all decide collectively that what happened around the COVID pandemic really was a tipping point towards, uh, towards the, 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 uh, the adoption of open science. Um, it, when the um, when the pandemic, uh, very fairly early in the pandemic, the the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House, with the Allen Institute and some funders, mandated that a certain amount of uh, that 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 articles be made available in an open resource, the CORD nineteen database, and that was something that initially was a few tens of thousands of documents. When they closed it about six months ago, I think it got up to about four hundred thousand documents. And at Frontiers, you know, we published a number of papers that benefited directly that that used text and data mining, uh, machine learning algorithms over that database to to kind of extract insights that no one individual would ever be able to extract mm. on their own by by having access to the to to a database. And what that what that that underscores the absolute necessity that scientific research on the day of publication not only has to be available universally, but it has to be available in in uh, formats that are machine readable, that are sort of um, AI ready, mm-hmm. so that researchers can actually fully exploit that content and fully extract insights that will lead to things like uh, improved treatments uh, and, and vaccines. You know, Frontiers, we we did a um, a survey of, of, of COVID researchers, and um, the vast majority of them agreed with the statement that having access to the CORD-19 database as an open, open uh, resource, as an uh, organized repository of content, accelerated the, uh, the development of treatments and, and vaccines. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, the, the question that comes up is, you know, the natu- uh, reason I think it's going to be a tipping point is because what comes up, what the ne- question that next arises is, well, what about the mental health crisis, or what about climate change, or what about cancer, or respiratory illness, yes. what about all of these other, do they not also deserve to have a open repository of, of content so that people can actually uh, extract the same level of insights and actionable um, uh, um, uh, yeah, insights, mm-hmm. to use this, the same word, but yeah, I mean, so that's why I think it's going to be a tipping point because I think people slowly and you hear the call every once in a while. You know, when the, when monkeypox was starting to become an issue, there was a call to have an open monkeypox resource, mm-hmm. and so you know, so I think that 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 is going to that is going to be the really uh, uh, an incremental pressure against this the the wall, the falling wall, the falling wall of of of. Um, Towards a regime where open science principles are actually uh, the dominant, the, the 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 dominant principles in scientific publishing, and where we are today, what do you think prevents us from replicating this model to those challenges that you just mentioned? Well, you know, I think I, I think it's 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 uh, um, it's about leadership. It's about people making sure that um, when they work with their with their publishers, that they that that um, that. They negotiate deals that they that that are compatible with these types of of, of solutions. I think that um, most most institutions are are locked into deals that rely the publisher to release some kind of um, 
to make some kind of contractual concession in terms of making this type, the, 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 this, these types of solutions available. But I hope that that uh, public pressure and pressure from the policy space too. One of the one of the projects we have at Frontiers is a policy labs project where we try to um, reinforce this this um, communication between policymakers, decisional decisional people in decisional positions, and scientists, mm -hmm. and um, and so that so that evidence-based policy becomes a norm, becomes the way of trying to address issues. Now, that is the type of interface that I think would be very, very useful in terms of, in terms of uh, bringing awareness to the policy people that, yes, there is a way forward that, that will be far more effective in terms of uh, addressing many of these societal challenges. Mm -hmm. And uh, we spoke about COVID and the um, open science in COVID. What is your reaction to the support for open science and the cancer moonshot uh, from the U.S. government? What yeah. impact do you think that's going to have? Yeah, yeah, no. Look, I think that I think that uh, President Biden and the the OSTP, I think they're absolutely on the right track, and they and they they, they understand in their in, in in their gut at the gut level that that it's just the right thing to do. I mean, they they, they I think most people, if outside the publishing context, if you explain to them how open science uh, functions, if you explain to them that that uh, the researchers uh, around the world do not have systematic access to, to, to scientific publications. They just don't understand it. It's, it's really hard for somebody outside the publishing context to understand how the status quo could have been extended for, for, for so long, you know? And, um, um, you know, the, it, the, uh, in, in terms of the cancer moonshot, in terms of what the OSTP is doing, the, the recent the policy guidance that they gave for it, not they didn't call it open access, they called it public access, mm -hmm. but it still very much goes in the right direction. And I do hope that they stick to their guns and that they decide to do the right thing, that they say, okay, we're not, we're not going to worry too much about how this might this might have an effect on on business models, uh, how publishers might have to respond in terms of being able to, um, you know, what the commercial implications might be. But just, you know, we are paying for research. Fended, federally funded research should be open in useful formats on the day of publication. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think you'll see that um, um, that there there are going to be um, there's going to be a little bit of a, a skirmish around that. I think just as there was around Plan S when Plan mm -hmm. S was released. Uh, uh, three, three and a half years ago, um, you know, the, the, the initial principles of Plan S were very, very powerfully stated, very clear and powerful. And then slowly over the course of time, they have been uh, some, some of the, the, the core principles, for example, no hybrid publishing. Uh, um, th these, have, these actually have been um, reintegrated into, in, 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 in a way, reformulated in a way, so that they're actually, it's actually considered to be a way forward, uh, you know, it's it's it has received a, a, a the sanction of coalition as as a way forward. So what we have to do is make sure that 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 the principles apply. That that people who decide that there is a way forward, that the 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 right way forward, and they 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 should they should stick to their guns and 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 let the let let the commercial realities sort of adjust to this to the uh, because you know the one thing I'll say is. Um, you know, in order to be able to conduct science, scientific research, as, as you know, the, the prerequisite is having access to the literature. Right. You, cannot, you, you, cannot, you cannot be sure that your scientific question, you can't, you can't do the background on it if you don't have, if you don't have access to the entire scientific uh, literature. Now, um, people around the world, it levels the playing field. If you have all, all of the scientific literature openly available, that anybody anywhere in the world can begin their their voyage, their scientific voyage. They can pose their question and do their background research, and it's 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 there. There is no inherent uh, in advantage for being at an institute that has the resources to 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 subscribe to all of the the the, uh, the scientific journals. You see, I think, of course. Um, you know, uh, in op in the open access dynamic right now, you know, and you know. We, I talked about being creative. We talk about innovation. We also have to be creative and innovative in terms of the the, the financial models that we have to um, uh, negotiate and develop with our commercial partners. You know, um, APCs are a it's, it's an ad hoc way of paying for articles, um, and we are working hard now to think about ways to to um, 
uh, how should I put it, to, to work together with institutions so that their needs are heard in terms of how these, the publishing services are going to be, mm -hmm. uh, to be supported. Mm -hmm. And, um, but that's, that problem can be solved on the, on the publishing services side. I think it's far more important, almost from a human rights perspective, that everybody, have, everybody has access to the, to, to the advancements and the benefits of, of scientific research. And so that's, at the, that, that's the readership side of things. Okay. Yeah. And um, you mentioned uh, earlier that uh, one of the uh, things that you enjoyed uh, during your journey in publishing uh, was seeing the, um, how it has evolved and the changes, being able to witness that. Yeah, not even just witness it, but be part of it. I and mean, be it's part been, of it, of course. It's right. been absolutely, uh, it's absolutely gratifying. And I think that the, um, you know, I, I, I don't quite know how to put this, but the, um, you know, when we launched Frontiers in Neuroscience in 2007 at this Society for Neuroscience meeting in San Diego, uh, we had a we had we had a stand and people came by and we talked to them. We explained to them. most people didn't even understand what open access was. They had they, 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 at that point in time there was very there were, plus had plus one had just been launched. There, there was a there was a yeah, certain number of open access journals, but it wasn't widespread. And um, Frontiers made a very powerful demonstration, and that's that. Um, quality publishing services can be provided at, at scale. You, you can have a, a large commercial publisher, a successful commercial publisher, that publishes quality articles through open access channels. And that demonstration participates in this virtuous cycle of, of taking open access forward. And, you know, um, I often, I, 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 tell, I tell the team at, at Frontiers, the, 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 in the U.S., uh, for the OSTP, the, in their policy guidance in, 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 uh, in uh, Plan S, Coalition S, um, they never would have been able to move forward with these types of mandates if organizations like Frontiers hadn't firmly demonstrated that open science works. Open science is very clearly a, all the pieces of the machine are in place, and it is a, it, it, there's absolutely no reason not to move uh, uh decisively in that direction. And I think uh, funding uh, agencies also have a part in that where they mandate the, that you have to publish your I research. I keep cutting you off, I know, but, uh, <laughs> but, but the funders, absolutely, the funders recommend the return on investment. And that's what the, the Plan S is all about, mm -hmm. is all about funders getting together and saying, like, we're paying for the research. We want this to be, we want the, the work that we pay for to be not just immediately and universally available, but participating in databases and, you know, to be fully, uh, to, to, to participate fully in the research innovation cycle. And um, yeah, and so the, the funders are, are really one of the, 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 the driving forces behind this. Mm -hmm. um, maybe moving on to a slightly different topic. At Frontiers, you have what is called collaborative peer review. Could you explain what makes this type of peer review process different from the standard peer review? Yeah, so, so the, the, uh, the, the peer review process at Frontiers goes back to about 2005 and 2006 when we were thinking about how we were going to build the platform uh, for the, f at, the, at the very, very start. And um, what we realized, well, you know, Henry and Camilla Markram and, and the small team that we were, um, you know, I wouldn't say that peer review was, was broken, but peer review very, very um, uh, obviously needed to be improved. And I think that if you were to pick two words to describe the peer review at the time, uh, it, it, would, it would probably, you would say it was, it was antagonistic and it was opaque. People didn't know exactly what reviewers were doing and that the, you'd get an editorial decision. Um, you know, you'd get the reviewer reports, but sometimes, um, um, and, and often the, the reports were quite hostile. And um, I mean, I think we've all lived through that, through, through, the, through that process. So the idea was to say, okay, look, let's, let, let, let's, after an initial report, let's get everybody together and have them talk about the quality of the paper. The reviewers, the, the handling editor, the authors, let's all have a discussion around the quality of the paper and what needs to be done still in order for this paper to be, to be publishable. So that's why it's collaborative, because people are able, to, in this forum, they're able to talk about what really still needs to be done in order, for, in order to take the, the paper forward. Um, now, the other, the other side of the same uh, process is the fact that at Frontiers, we always publish the names of the reviewers and the handling editor on every paper. Mm -hmm. So um, a reviewer, for example, knows that if the paper is published, that their, their name is going to appear on the front of the paper as the expert that validated this paper as a, as, as a, um, as, as a uh, quality contribution. So that f that gives a certain amount of focus in the in the in the in the uh, the review process. You know, the reviewer is saying, "Well, look, 
my name is going to be on this thing. Um, if that's the case, I really want, I really, you know, you have to, uh, the, the author, you have to fix the following three bits because those are the three things that I'm uncomfortable about you know, if my name is going to be on the, on, on the paper. So it puts a little bit of more skin in the game. It's, it's, it, 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 I think it incentivizes the authors to be, um, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not just responsible, but, you know, they, 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 they um, yeah, they, they have more, um, yeah, the, the, a little bit of their reputation is at stake somehow, right? right. So the, but also it's recognition. You know, back in, the, in, in 2006, every, no one started talking about review or recognition yet. And, you know, we felt very, very strongly that this is also a way of recognizing the reviewer for their role as, as, as the expert that worked on the, on, on the paper. Mm -hmm. So it works quite well. See, the, the reviewer has a, has a fairly um, objective threshold. You know, my name is going to be on this thing. I, I, so I, I really want to make sure that, that, that the following points are addressed before, before I'm going to uh, endorse this paper for publication. But some would argue that this much transparency uh, could deter some reviewers from accepting. You know, the, it, it could deter them from accepting, and and that and that's there's also the option of rejecting, right? I mean, so that's that. It, but the the. I'll say that, for example, you know, at Frontiers we were involved in a couple of European projects on uh, on open science, on peer review, open peer review, and this sort of thing. And uh, there is no perfect peer review process. I mean, mm -hmm. we can talk about the, the pros and cons of different processes. I think what we have at Frontiers is something that works pretty well because um, the reviewers the reviewers know that um, uh, that they can they can recommend rejection. They can uh, uh, and you know the, and we do reject more papers than we accept. So that you know it, it's it's it is a, uh, a, a, a very likely outcome of, a, of an editorial assessment. But, um, the, but the fact that they have this accountability uh, is, is something that really focuses minds. And I think uh, um, it's, it's not, the reviewers are not able to do it lightly because they do have a little bit of reputational skin mm -hmm. in the game. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, before we move on to our, our next question, uh, I just want to remind the audience that you have a chance to engage with us and ask your questions. Just raise your hand on Zoom and we will be happy to take your questions. Um, what would you consider to be the driving success of uh, Frontiers, along with the open access model and perhaps also the collaborative peer review model? So what helps, what helps it stand out in academic publishing? Yeah, I mean, um, I think well, we, we kind of touched upon it a little bit. I mean, I think the Frontiers has participated in sort of this, this, this dynamic, um, uh, this open science dynamic has really sort of the, has provided the, the demonstrated the, the 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 fact that open science can be done at scale. I think that 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 has been an important contribution to Frontiers. More generally, though, I think um, what's the, one of a, an important um, imp impetus. In, the, in this whole game is just the fact that everybody understands that the benefits of open science are obvious enough so that no one dares even say anymore that we're not moving in that direction. It's just a question of time, time, time frames and, and you know, how long it's gonna take us to get there. So everybody mm -hmm. understands we have to get there. And, um, and you know, the success of, of Frontiers is something which reminds people that yes, we can actually get there probably a little bit faster than, 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 than you might think we can, mm -hmm. you know? And um, yeah, I don't know if that's if if that's if if that answers the question. Um, yes, so just serving as a model. Yeah, you know, and not just as a model, but you know, success speaks very loudly for itself. As a successful model. It's a successful <laughs> model, right? Right. Okay. So I think we're out of time. Um, I want Already? to thank you. Yes, it was okay. very. <laughs> uh, we didn't get to all our questions, but I want to thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you. It's been it's been a lot of fun, and uh, yeah. Thank, thank you. you and thank you for our audience for joining us. Um, we will now take a short break and uh, we will return with our next conversation after the break. Thank you.